Good to see you guys. Andrew, I'm sorry. We all made mistakes. <laughs> yeah, a few of you guys have been spreading some rumors that I haven't been here. I don't know where that comes from, so we're just going to have to, you know, make sure. We publicly clear the record. I have only missed the week I went to take fruit down for this church and the church school. So besides that, it was fifth Sabbath, so that's why it feels like it was a longer time. I have not been leaving you. So take that voice out of your head, because today we're going to talk about voices in our heads. And some people call that schizophrenia. Some people say that's a bad thing. In fact, I believe the devil wants to take everything that has truth and twist it just a little. And so what we're doing today is we're going to talk about uh, the voices that are in our heads. And uh, before this, though, I want to remind us where we came from. We're going through our beliefs. So if you want to know what we're going to be talking about, we're talking about the beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. However, we start with the Word of God. We didn't, I didn't come here and preach a sermon try to convince you of the Word of God. I'm coming with a little bit more of a practical application of it. And we talked about how we could approach the Word of God and not bringing what God's reasonable service was the last time I was here, which was to not bring our own ideas with us um, and try to, ex to have the Word of God explain what we already believe, but instead to approach the Word of God with a true, open, sacrificed perspective and allow God to teach us. Today, we're going to look at these voices and see what we can establish, and I hope you'll figure out which doctrine we're covering as we do that. In John chapter 10, we began in verse 10. So turn back there, and as you do, I'll tell you a, a little experience I had. In fact, if we come to God and we have a little bit of ourselves involved, if we've got a little bit of me and my philosophy and my ideas, it could be very disastrous. And I learned this firsthand through a different experience. I, was, I bought this uh, system at home. It's, it's just basically a rope type thing that uh, is called TRX Trading. Anybody heard of that before? Anybody? No? A few of you? Yeah, shaking your head. So basically, what it is is like you can hook it up to a tree outside. You can hook it up to the door in your house, however. And you can pretty much do any kind of workout at home using your weight resistance. And so I was like, oh, that's cool. In case I travel, things like that, I could keep trying to stay in shape. Try to get rid of the excuses. So my son, uh, going to the same school here where there's a sickness being passed around, he picked that up. And he had made a little mess in my room because there was a door I usually do it from. And so I cleaned up the mess. But you know when the carpet is still wet, you're kind of not wanting to do it there, right? So I changed the door, which I put the system with. And, and the, when you do it on the door, it's got a little, uh, little hook on the other side, or not a hook, but a, like a little bigger part. And that you know, rests on the other side. So when you put your weight, it can't come through is the idea, right? But on the door I put it on, there was a little crack. But I figured, it's just a little crack. It's not a big deal. So what I did is the kids were downstairs. Isaac wasn't feeling well, so they were watching some 3 ABN kids' time. And uh, I was up there, and I was trying to work on my core. So I was watching this video, and it took me a while to figure out what the guy was doing. But essentially, it was this. I had to grab the rope up here, hold it up on the top. And I had to completely lean this way, so you're putting your whole weight. And then I had to drop my hips completely down and then bring them back up. And it sounds easier than it is. It's, I'm still sore. And uh, so when I dropped my hips and my complete weight was there, I hit the floor. And the kids were like, what happened? And uh, my wife said if she had seen it, she'd probably still be laughing. She loves to see me fall. But uh, it, it made me realize that even a small crack can make us fall. Even a small crack in our view of God can make us fall to the ground. And so in John chapter 10, and uh, before I read, I do want to have a quick word of prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we approach your throne, and we ask, Father, that you would speak to each of us as we go through this message today. Father, train us to hear your voice. Teach us, Father, so that we can know you and we can experience you at a deeper level in our lives. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 10 and verse 10, it says, The thief comes not, but for what purpose? But to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I am come that they might have what? 
that they might have life. So there's two entities here. One is a thief, a, 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 a liar, and a killer, right? And the other one is coming for what purpose? To give you life. So when God comes, does he come to kill you? Does he come to take from you? What does he come for? To give you life and to give you life more abundantly. And if we don't have that right in our brain, when God comes, we will fall instead of find life. And I want you to see as we continue on. But jump down with me to verse 14 now. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Then verse 16, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice. Thank you. So he's promising that you'll hear his voice. So let me ask the question, and I want you to really genuinely think about it. When is the last time that you heard the voice of God? I mean, really heard his voice. That you knew that it was him. That you were known of him. That you heard God. Because I think sometimes we, we fail miserably on teaching what we really need to be learning, and that is to learn to hear God's voice. I think we work on a lot of other areas. We look, work on a lot of other things, but most of us, if we're completely and brutally honest, I think, just possibly, some of us have even bought into the idea that we can't hear God's voice directly anymore. Well, yeah, we believe we can hear his voice maybe through the church or through a message or through reading the Bible, but I'm talking about a personal God, a God that would come to you and speak to you because there was a lot of people who read their Bibles and they were called Pharisees and, and they didn't hear God's voice at all. So I think sometimes we've overextended the idea that the word of God is God's voice to the point that we've actually neglected his voice because we thought we had it in the Bible. Now, don't misunderstand. This is God's voice, but it's only God's voice as it speaks to you. And there's a difference. There's a huge difference. And so God is a God that communicates to us, not just through the word of God, though, my friends. The word of God he will not conflict with, but he actually communicates to you as an individual. And if you're not experiencing that, then I think the first place to begin is to find out why. And so I want to take us back to Genesis chapter 3, where I think I can show you why. Genesis chapter 3, if you'll turn there with me. You guys probably got it memorized, right? Genesis chapter 3, the fall. You're like, what are we going to learn in Genesis chapter 3? Well, I hope you learn nothing from me, but I hope you hear God. Genesis chapter 3 at verse 1. You guys there? I know you guys can find Genesis. It's the first book. It's only a few pages in. Genesis chapter 3. Are you guys alive, awake? Hello? <laughs> I got a little nervous because Diane posted something on Facebook, and I was, I was kind of concerned that you guys were going to be looking like, you know, all these faces, right? <laughs> so that would be really awkward, right? <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3 at verse 1. I don't want to neglect this side, so sometimes I seem to focus over there, so I'm coming here. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. Now, you guys are good Adventists. Who is the serpent? The devil. How do you know that? The Bible tells us later. Good answer. Revelation chapter 12, right? It tells us that the serpent is the devil of old, right? That came down. Okay, so we know this is the devil, and God categorizes him as subtle. So I got out my dictionary. I said, what in the world is subtle? What does that mean? So let's see what the dictionary said subtle means. It says, using clever and indirect methods to achieve something. So to be subtle is to be a little indirect, to be clever, to be clever and indirect. So I thought, if the devil is subtle, then God must be forthright. Right? 
He's not trying to be clever with you. He's not trying to be uh, indirect with you, but he's trying to be very direct and straightforward. He's just going to tell you like it is, right? So that's God versus the devil. And so we're going to continue on. So the devil was what, my friends? He was subtle. He was subtle. So let's see if you can catch how subtle he is. In fact, I think he's so subtle that he's used Genesis chapter 3 to continue teaching you lies. In fact, I've had to wrestle over Genesis chapter 3 fresh this week. And I think you're going to experience it here as we go through. Notice what it says. He said, yes, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So he asks Eve a very simple question. He says, hey, did God tell you that, that all the trees in the garden are off limits? And so good Eve, she's perfect, she's innocent. She thinks, I'll correct his false view. I'll help him out. Have you ever been asked a question by someone who had no interest in the truth? Guys, don't argue with the devil. So she comes to the devil. She says, okay, no, no, no. no, no you, you got it wrong, devil. It's, it's, we could eat of all the trees, but just not this one. Because God has said what? In the day that you eat of it or touch it, she says. Now, some people I've heard, even in our church, have argued, well, she, she added the touch. Um, but read it again. It says, for God has said... You shall not eat of it nor touch it. Who said it? God said it. Who cares if it wasn't written, guys? We serve a living God who communicates to his people. Do we really believe that if it wasn't written in the pages before that God had it communicated, then you would not believe Jude because Jude was telling us things that God had said about Enoch that were never recorded in Genesis and so on and so on. So God said it. He didn't tell him just not to eat of it. He said, don't even touch it. Then it goes on. And uh, the serpent said back to the woman. And I could picture the serpent holding the fruit in his hands. You shall not surely die. So God said, if you touch it or eat it, you will Die, and here's the serpent holding the fruit and saying, No, that's not true. That's not true. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be what? Your eyes shall be open. Remember what he said here, because this is going to be very important. Your eyes shall be open. And you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And guess what? The devil was 100% right. I didn't think you would hear me say that, right? I've been wrestling over this. As soon as they ate it, the Bible says their eyes were open. Then you go to the next page, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22, and it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Huh. So who's the, tr the one telling the truth? It almost appears as if it's the devil. Are you seeing this? Because the devil said, hey, God said if you touch it, you're going to die. And he's touching it, and he's not dead. And then they touched it, and they didn't die. And he said, hey, God knows that the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And then the Bible confirms the very words that he said. Hmm. But what is the devil? He's subtle. He's subtle. Understand that though there was elements of truth. Remember, what is the name of the tree that they ate from? Good and evil. So I want you to follow this through. They got all these things fulfilled in the measure of good and evil. And this doesn't make sense to you yet, but I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to demonstrate it. In other words, it was not true that they became like God, knowing good and evil, in the way that God intended for them to. Okay? 
God was not withholding from them. He wanted them to know good and evil, believe it or not. He didn't want them to know it intimately. He didn't want them to experience it. But the fact that the tree was there is a sign that God was not withholding the knowledge that evil existed. In fact, he was allowing them to experience what only God has, which is to say no to evil. Okay? But to know of its existence, he was not hiding from them, as some have bought into and believe the devil's lie. He was not hiding that. You see, the Bible tells us in 1 John, and this is how I know that they hadn't become like God in the sense like God himself, and knowing good and evil in the way God does, because it says in 1 John that God is light and there is how much darkness in him? There's no darkness in him. And so they now could not be like God in that manner because they allowed darkness into them. God knew of sin, but he didn't know sin in a personal and intimate way. Now, on the cross and before the cross, Jesus experienced all the consequences of sin, but yet there was no sin in him himself. So he knows what you feel. He knows what you're going through. But he's never done the act himself. Does this make sense so far? What does the devil do according to Scripture? Does he open our eyes? No, 1 Corinthians tells us he closes our eyes. He closes our eyes. So here's the thing that I want you to grasp is that the opening of the eyes that he referred to, remember he's subtle, is that he knew, the devil knew that as soon as sin entered, grace would much more abound. So let me ask you the question, who opened their eyes? That was God. Watch it play out. Watch it play out. Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were what? Were open, and they knew that they were naked. And guess what they did? Here's the evil. So that's the good. Watch it play out, guys. It's going to be good mixed with evil the whole way through. So, so they, their eyes were open, good or bad? Good. We want our eyes opened, okay? Now, their eyes were open before, don't misunderstand, but now their eyes were open to something they hadn't experienced or seen before. Their eyes were open to the consequence of their sin. The covering that had been covering them of light was now gone, and they knew it. But who revealed that fact to them? We're going to find out very shortly. But when God reveals to us, oftentimes what we do is we say, okay, let me fix it. So watch what they did. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron, uh, aprons. Uh, so Abraham heard the voice of God. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a mighty nation. I'm going I'm to bless you with a large inheritance. And he says, oh, well, God, the woman you gave me is not able to do that. So he went and sewed some aprons and got another woman. It's going to help God out. What tree was he eating from? the knowledge of good and evil. So we continue on. So he made themselves aprons. Look at verse 8. And they heard who? Who did they hear? The voice of the Lord God walking the garden of the cool of the day. And how did they respond? They hid themselves. Are you noticing the good and the evil? So every time God comes, now that they've eaten this tree, what is intended for good becomes evil. Every single time. You're going to watch it just go back and forth. And I hadn't caught this before. Watch as it goes on again. And, and don't we do that too? Don't we do that too? When God comes, we hear his voice. Don't we try to fix it? Don't we try to hide? Because our theology is that God is coming to kill us. God is coming to take from us. God is coming to withhold from us. God is coming as one who is our enemy. He's coming to give us the justice that is deserved. They were afraid now of God because they had, said, they had heard that if they touch it or they eat it, they will die. So now they heard God's voice and that God's voice means he's coming, which means he's coming for what purpose? To kill them. 
And this theology problem is going to make us die. I want us to understand, we're going to take God's voice and we're going to learn to hear only Satan's. And that is Satan's method that he's using. If he can twist it just a little bit, a little subtle, and if there's enough truth mixed in, he can train us not to hear God's voice at all. Our simple job, if I could sum up your entire Christian experience in one simple phrase, it would be learn to hear God's voice. Train yourself to hear God's voice. So it says this. Verse 9. And the Lord God called unto who? He called unto Adam. And said unto him, Where are you? Did God know where Adam was? Yes, but his voice was calling for Adam to make a response. His voice was not coming to condemn him, but his voice was coming to call him to himself. And Adam was afraid. And he tells you that. Watch what happens. Verse uh, 10. And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was what? I was afraid, because why? Because I was naked and hid myself. So he says, God, the reason I was hiding is because I realized I was naked. So God, in his beautiful love, is trying to train Adam's voice, or his, trying to train his mind to hear his voice again. So he asks him the next question. Who told you you were naked? You know who told him? It was God. It was God that told him he was naked. And so what he's saying is he's saying, hey, your, your, your mind is messed up now. I want you to hear me. But he couldn't hear. He couldn't hear. So, so as soon as he said, who told you you were naked, he still wasn't getting it. He wasn't saying, oh, it was you, God. You're the one that revealed that to me. You opened my eyes. You, you called for me. But he saw God through the knowledge of, tr of the tree of good and evil. It was subtle. It was subtle. So it goes on. He asks him a very plain question. He says, Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded that you should not eat? And I could picture that there were probably tears in his eyes. But Adam couldn't see the tears. Because Adam was too wrapped up in the idea that God was coming to kill him. So he couldn't discern that the voice was the voice of truth and mercy and love. He couldn't see that the one who was coming was coming to tell him that he was going to take his place. He couldn't see that the effect and, and the hurt in Christ's eyes as he was calling to him because Christ was simply saying, hey, could you acknowledge what you've done because I'm going to take it on my back. I'm going to take it in my side. I'm going to take it in my hands. I've got this for you. But it said the devil was still subtly telling him the truth, but yet mixed with error. A wrong view of God had been planted, and it's been continued to be passed down all the way to you and me. And so when we hear God's voice, we've been trained. We've been disciplined in how to covertly avoid it. We've learned how to just take a little truth and dodge the bullet. We're good at it. We're professionals at being subtle. In fact, you don't even have to work for it. You got it. So what does Adam do? God was simply looking for a straightforward confession. But Adam shows that he's now subtle. Watch what he does. And everything Adam says is true. It's 100% true. His response is not a lie. It just diverts one simple fact. Personal accountability. That's all it misses. Watch. He says this. And the man said, verse 12, the woman whom you gave to be with me. Did God give that woman to him? Yes. The woman you gave to be with me, she gave, doesn't it say, me of the tree and I did eat? When I read the Bible, that's exactly what it says happened. The woman that God gave to him gave of the fruit and he did eat. Did he lie? 
It's kind of like someone saying, I'm an alcoholic. What they're saying is, is that, that the alcohol is, my, is, is what is causing the problems. They're diverting a little bit. It's true. Alcohol is a nasty, insidious thing. But if you really want to know what is at the root of every alcoholic and every druggie and every person that has any kind of issue at all is not the alcohol at all. The alcohol, the drugs, all those things are ways to dodge the bullet. They're ways to get out of the problem, to avoid it for a little while, to hide in the trees, in the bushes, to keep themselves from having to be accountable. When all God was saying is, hey, if Adam had dropped to his knees and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did eat of it. Things would have been a lot different. You see, God didn't kick them out of the Garden of Eden because he wanted to kick them out. It didn't have to go down the way it went down, guys. The idea here is that God couldn't do anything else. He had to find a way to retrain us. He had to find a way to get us to once again see him for who he is. And I had to wrestle with this for a while. You know, I used to struggle with what does it mean to not be under the law but under grace? And I don't think I struggle anymore with that. Because what I realized is, is that if your experience with God is all just rule-based, if that's what it is, God said this, and that is, this is the consequence, that you are living under the law, and though all those things are true, you've bought into the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. It's subtly going to kill you. But when you live under grace, you see that mercy has always been above the law because God steps in your place. Because God takes your judgment and your justice. And when you see that, you don't see him as an enemy. You see him as life and life more abundantly. When you hear his voice, Instead of seeing that he's coming to condemn you, you hear his voice revealing the fact that you have stumbled so that he can help you. Amen. You see, if we don't get it right in our mind, then when God comes, we'll run and hide. We'll run and hide. And I think a lot of us are hiding when God is speaking to us. I think God is speaking to every one of you. I just don't know that every one of you have learned to identify his voice. I believe that God is personally asking each of you to take a part in this local church in a certain way. But I think some people are hiding. In fact, I believe if we were listening to God if we were really hearing his voice and we really had it down, I think people would be coming forward and saying, God asked me to do this. How can you support and aid this in my local church? God has asked me to do this. I, I don't think we'd have to beg anybody. But if if your theology is that if God sends someone that gives a clear direction and, and God just speaks through them to you, and then you're going to follow, then when the wolf figures that out, he'll say, I can take that guy out. Do you see? But if you're all listening to him, and if he's the one guiding each and every one of you, as he's guiding the leader that God sends to you, then when the wolf comes, he can take any of us out. It won't matter. Because he can't take God out. Is this making sense? So, Adam diverts and says the woman. What does the woman do? Let's see, God comes to the woman, and all he's wanting the woman to do is acknowledge, yes, God, yes, I messed up, I ate of it, but watch how subtle she gets. And the woman said, or God said, I'm sorry, verse 13, God said unto the woman, what is this that you have done? 
She heard condemnation. What is this that you have done? She saw that God, that now her husband just backed her off or threw every, all the blame on her, all the responsibility. So she was feeling under pressure. She had to do what? Dodge the bullet. So she turns off and she says, um, the serpent tricked me. Did the serpent trick her? Yeah, the serpent tricked her. And I did eat. Then God turns to the serpent, and he doesn't ask the serpent a single question. Because I want you to learn one thing, if you can learn it. If God is revealing something to you, if he's asking you why you did something, that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. It's not to bring shame. That's from the enemy. It's not to make you feel like you'll never measure up. That's the enemy's voice. If God is asking you a question, it's because he's there to help you. It's because he's there to guide you. It's because he wants you to be in an intimate and personal relationship with him. And he's trying to restore what's been broken. But when he came to the devil, all he did is said, you are cursed. You are going to be defeated. He gave no... No questions, because there's no hope for the devil. The devil's made his mind up. He's refused to listen to God. He's an enemy of God. He, his whole purpose and identity is there to take and to kill and destroy. He subtly tried to destroy our church. And you know what? If he could, if he could get us to go, oh, you know, look at all those, those clear evils. He would love us to just identify and see the evil. He would love us to just identify and see, hey, those people, they got it together. They're so good. And to put pastors and others on these high pedestals and all these things and all these missionaries and all these really good things. He loves for us to see good on one side and evil on the other, but he hates for anyone to see the middle. To actually understand his real war. Because his, his real war isn't about that, guys. That's so easy for us to go, that's bad. The real war is in your practical Christian experience. When, when God is telling you something, and you know he's telling you, but so-and-so in the church doesn't do that. It's good. Evil becomes all evil. You don't do it. You didn't listen to God's voice. You trained yourself. He comes back to you. But pastor doesn't do that trains you. But the conference doesn't do that. He's training you. The enemy, Satan, spends all his time training you to not hear God's voice. And we're to, we're to spend all of our time learning to hear his voice because salvation comes from hearing God's voice. Salvation comes from not, not, from not a, a person like me, but yet the Bible says that you hearing words from me could save your soul. Because salvation comes from discerning and hearing God's voice and, and, and identifying it and understanding it and following that voice. Everybody in the scripture that was saved, Abraham, all them, go read it again. It always says they heard his voice and they obeyed. They heard his voice and they obeyed. There's nobody in scripture that didn't hear God's voice. So that tells me God is speaking to all of you, but you may not recognize that he's speaking to you. But the second you recognize God's voice, you've had an encounter with God. Whether that voice be, you shouldn't be doing that, you know, sometimes we think these encounters with God are all these experiences where we just feel like taking our shoes off. Wow, what a powerful thing. I felt like I was in God's presence. But, you know, God speaks to us all the time. All the time. He, he gives us those experiences, but he also comes to us and, and we hear it and we don't like it all the time, right? We're like, I was trying to hide that, God. <laughs> Can we talk about something else? Right? identifying his voice, daily encounters with God, moment by moment. You know, it's a lie that God can't lead you. I used to start to think that maybe I started believing in some of these things where, oh, okay, you know, just do what you're going to do and, and God's big enough, he can change it. You know what? That rejects a personal God. 
There may be some truth in that, but that's, that's the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, God is able to communicate to you specifically what he wants you to do. And the Bible says that you will know it. It won't be a guessing game. It won't be like, is this really it? It only is that when we don't know his voice yet. And if you're there, don't despair. Start asking God to help you hear his voice. I want to make this practical. I could sit here and talk to you about salvation in, in the general sense that you're a sinner in need of God and all this stuff. You've heard all that before. But salvation comes from hearing God's voice and responding. You see, because it was lost at a tree. It's gained at a tree. It was at a tree that we inflicted the penalties of sin and the pain and the suffering. It's at a tree that Jesus took the penalties of sin and the pain and the suffering. It was, it was the lesson of Adam and his wife and the distrust that he had of him eating that fruit came from his understanding that God was going to take this beautiful woman that he had just given to him from, from him, right? How did, how did he get that woman? God caused Adam to go into a deep sleep and out of his side came this woman. Jesus went into a deep sleep and out of his side came new life. A new opportunity. As that blood shed, redemption was brought to you and me. What would keep you from saying, God, help me. Help me to hear and to understand your voice. And train yourself. It's going to take an effort. It's going to take an effort that is, is different than just reading your Bible and just saying a few prayers. It's going to take an effort of paying attention and listening. You're going to fall sometimes. Sometimes you're going to realize that there is a crack in the door. And people might laugh at you. They might ridicule you. But my friends, you never will overcome. You will never succeed if you don't take the chance to seek out God's voice. That's my prayer for each of you. But I do have a very specific appeal. You see, God placed upon my heart last year that this year, for this coming year, um, I was going to, uh, he wanted me to choose a family each week and pray for him. But then he said, so that, that's easy. So, uh, you know, then he says, but let them know about it. So then I was like, okay, so I got to write a card. I mean, this isn't me. That's not what I normally do. So I was like, okay, I'll write a card. And then at the beginning of the year, God is so good that, you know, as I was thinking about how to do this, because, you know, I've, you know, I'm, praying anyways, right? I pray in the car, pray in the morning when I wake up, things like that. So I watched this movie that came out. It was called The War Room. Anybody seen that? A few of you? This side of the church has watched it. This side hasn't. You guys are in trouble. No, <laughs> okay, so, so I watched The War Room. I watched it once with my wife. Then uh, I invited some church members and, to my house and we watched it together. And then I was up in Michigan, and I was with Diane's sister, and she hadn't watched it in a friend of hers, so we watched it together. So now I've seen it how many times? Three. Yeah, sorry, not that one. This one. <laughs> Three times. And each time I watched it, and, I, and I'm being vulnerable here with you. I'm a very slow learner. Each time I watched it, I go, ooh, that's cool. That was a great movie, but it changed me in no way. Zero. I didn't do anything different. I just did what most of you guys do when you hear a good sermon. You go, ah, oh, that's a good sermon. You go home, and you don't do anything different. I mean, let's be honest, right? That happens. And so I watched it three times, and I hadn't done anything different. The God was like, he spoke to me. He says, uh, was it good? Yeah, it was good. What are you doing? <laughs> Same thing I was doing before, God. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so I had to humble myself. And it's not a method, guys. It's not, you know, but I, I decided to do it just like they did in the movie. I cleared out a spot in my closet. I got out some paper. 
And I started writing down specific areas in my life. I started writing the churches down. I started putting the people down that I'm praying for. And whatever requests I had for them, I wrote them all out. And so the first day I did it, uh, Levi and Caleb were there. Isaac was at school. And they were playing, you know, in nearby because they don't like to be too far from dad. And so I started praying for the people on the wall. And I had my sons on there, Isaac, Levi, Caleb. And I didn't think they were paying attention. Well, the next day, I went to go pray again, and Levi goes, he's five years old. And, you know, I've spent my entire life praying for him, trying to teach him to want to pray. And he says to me, Dad, I want to do that. So I said, okay. You know, we put his little prayer wall up. And I said, what, who do you want to pray for? So he puts down who he wants to pray for. And then when he puts dad, I didn't like what he put on there. It's like, what? Are you, are you viewing this right? <laughs> but I wrote it down because it's his prayer list. And I said, well, maybe God's trying to communicate something to me that I didn't know. We've got to hear his voice, right? And so a five-year-old starts responding. And it's not a method, guys. It's listening to what God is telling you to do. But I... I do want to challenge you. This is a very specific appeal. I've taken it upon myself. I've heard God tell me to pray for you uh, and not just generally like I, I normally would do or just praying for the church or whatever else, but to specifically pray for each and every one of you. And as God puts on my heart, I choose a family and I pray. Each week. And, and the weird thing is I first started, I thought he was just saying pray for him for one week, but so far I wrote them on my wall and I don't have any erasers, so I've been praying for them week after week. But I can't do it alone. Then it hit me, and it was like God was saying, ask the church to join you. Ask the church if they would be willing to help you in this task. And so that's what I'm doing. I want to know if any of you would say, hey, I'll choose one church family per week. And, and, and I don't want you to all get together and say, oh, I'm praying for this one, I'm praying for that one. I want you to just ask God, look at the directory, and whoever he puts on your heart, pray for them. But don't just pray for them. Let them know you're praying for them. And ask them through a card or a phone call or a visit, however you want, what requests they have. And I have enough faith to believe that we'd pray for the whole church. I believe God would place upon your heart. And if, and if one family is being specifically targeted that week and it seems like it's a little lopsided, it might just be because that person or that family is at the brink of making a very vital decision. So don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. Hear his voice. But would you? Would you help? Because the last time I checked, the only thing God was concerned about was whether his church was praying or not. Because he knew if the church was praying, that the church would start to work. And he knew that, that the only way we're going to start to hear his voice is if we start to pray. And so, who's with me? And don't just jump up and say you're going to do it and then and, and, and then, and then just, you know, just be doing it because you're saying that. You want somebody to see you, right? With the tinkling bells and all that. Oh, I'm a holy person. I'm going to pray for others. And I'm not saying don't let that voice in your head go, but if I commit to this and I mess up or don't do it this day, then I'm a horrible person. Forget all that. Forget what obstacles or, or how bad your prayer life may or may not be right now already. Do you hear God's voice asking you, to pray. Is there anybody here that will say, I'll, I'll take a family. I'll take one. And I'll pray for them every week. I'll let them know I'm praying. Guys, could you imagine what that could do to our church? People wouldn't have to guess if you care about them. They would know. And maybe some people would start hearing his voice. Maybe we could start praying, Lord, what would you have me to do?
what would you have this family to do? Wouldn't it be cool if you started hearing reports of people going, hey, God told me. God told me I, I, I need to do this ministry in the church. Praise God. Praise God. Because, guys, we're struggling. We are struggling. I don't have any elders to help. We don't have all the things we need to accomplish the work. And I think maybe we've dis the enemy has disguised himself and we think that the enemy is the leadership or it's these people or it's this person or it's this or it's that. What if we started actually praying and fighting the real enemy? Which there's one enemy that wants to destroy the debated church. And it's the devil. And he wants to kill it. He wants to stop it. But I do not believe that he will win. Not if we pray. Not if we hear his voice. The voice of God, that is. I was just talking about the devil. Not his voice, right? The voice of God. And so, my friends, please, if you've raised your hand, please don't, don't go home and, and think about it later. Go home right away. Or, or even before you leave, ask God to tell you who your first person is going to be, your first family is going to be, and pray for them. And I hope, though my, my name may not be uh, officially a, a member of this specific church because they make a pastor have to have it one, I am a member of this church. You can pray for me and my family too. And some of you already are, I know that. Thank you. But guys, let's let each other know. Let's let each other know we're a family, right? So, let me pray for you. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you that you're a God that's intimate. That you're a God that comes to us not to condemn us, but to save us. That you're a God, Lord, that would take the most vile and debased and that would make it into something that's precious and beautiful. Lord, that you're a God that wants to communicate to us. Father, we, we, we don't ask you to communicate to us. We ask you that you would help us to identify your voice. Because we know you're talking day after day. You're, 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 you're speaking to us. You're telling us and guiding us and and, and all this, and all the while, we're, we're crying out, Lord, speak to us. And you're yelling, I am. But we can't hear you. Open our ears, O oh Lord. Open our eyes that we can see. And help us, Father, to not be tricked by the wily old serpent. Help us not to fight against each other. But Lord, I pray that we would unite together in prayer. Lord, I pray that we would be a people that would be strong enough and brave enough to identify the real enemy and to stop believing his half-truths and to stop looking and saying, hey, yeah, this is confirmed. Our pastor doesn't do this or does this or, or this person does this or doesn't do that, but that we would instead pray that the enemy would be removed. And that truth would reign. That we would, Lord, learn your grace. And we would learn how to give it to others even when they don't deserve it. Because that is what grace really is. Father, help us, we pray. Solve our issues by helping us to deal with them. And to be accountable to you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Our closing song is... Uh